Hey, hey, and welcome to a brand new episode of Straight Up Show Podcast. I am your host, Calvin, joined with my co-host, Lee and Mitch. How are you guys doing today? Great. We're good. All right. Hey, guys. We're just days away from a November presidential and other races election coming up. I mean, what do you guys think about that? Like, this is going to be a historic race, right? Man, beyond historic. I've, in, uh, I am 36 years old, and I have not seen anything like this in my lifetime. Yeah, uh, I agree. This is definitely one of the most, if not the most important election probably in my lifetime that I've seen. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty essential that uh, everyone go out there and vote in my opinion. So my first question to all of y'all, well, this would be actually second question, I guess. Uh, um, have y'all voted yet? I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. I, I have not voted yet. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to live in a place with early voting. Um, I just haven't taken the time to actually research everything, you know, that's uh, on the ballot this time um, because that, you know, that is important to do. Right. Uh, I have not voted yet, but it's not because I'm undecided. I'm just uh, also likely I'm researching everything that's on my local um, amendments and ballots. Um, and also there's only one one voting uh, station here. Uh, so it's been crazy, crazy busy. So I've been trying to find the right time to go. But uh, yeah. But just to clarify, you too will vote, right? Yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Indeed. Okay, and like I said, like Mitch said, there is uh, somewhat uh, as may, some may see uh, voter suppression, like having a big. Uh, <clears throat> well, we're in Louisiana. We have parishes. We don't have counties uh, where they only have a one parish to where it's only one polling, early polling location for I think what two hundred thousand people uh, right. in y'all's in y'all's parish. So that's kind of hard to do, and kind of be kind of can be discouraging on top of the other discouragements going on about voting and voting early because some people are scared to vote because of the uh, outgoing intimidation by certain people uh, of, you know, not going to vote, you know, and uh, they had some officer uh, have a, his uh, political affiliation on his mask uh, at polling locations. And, and actually, as of today, as we're recording this, news broke out that in, in New York City, <clears throat> there was a police officer uh, who was going down the streets, down the polling locations, screaming his political affiliation uh, to voters. And so you got a cop in a position of power screaming, hey, this is what, you know, trying to suppress people's votes. And so that's what we're talking about today is no matter what, your vote matters. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that Mitch and, and Lee will go out and vote. Right, guys. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, it's it's very important that you go out there to vote. Uh, this is a historic uh, election. I think uh, that uh, Lee and uh, uh, Mitch, uh, I was telling you guys that it's not so much the uh, character of Joe Biden or uh, Donald Trump. Uh, it's the character of the presidency. Agreed. Definitely. Yeah, and so that's what's online. To me, that's what's online right now. And I think that, and 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 this is maybe a rhetorical question to ask Mitch or Lee. But Mitch, what does USA stand for? <laughs> like uh, literally, or uh, <laughs> yeah, it sounds crazy, right? But right. literally, what does USA stand for? And, you know, the United States of America. <laughs> and Lee, what's the first word in the U part? I'll be united. And so the key word to the USA, United States of America, is the word united. And I, I find myself not liberal, not democratic, not Republican, because if you listen to our previous episodes, we were definitely deemed as black Republicans. And nothing wrong with that, but I, I try to keep myself apolitical, you know what I mean? Because me, I grew up in the, I don't say slum, but I grew up in the projects, definitely during the crack epidemic. And so there are some things that Joe Biden did that I didn't like. And, you know, and I can't speak enough about what Trump's doing. But at the same time, I have to, like, like Lee said, research what's going out there. And I, I actually, as a, uh, this is my, I think, third election voting for a president. 
And I actually did my research. I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to give Trump the opportunity. I'm going to give Biden the opportunity to, you know, get me as your vote. You know what I mean? And I think this is what you all have to do, like Lee was saying, research. And <clears throat> and so I said, well, I looked at the first debate, which we know was really <laughs> – it, it was embarrassing. <laughs> so bad they had to make a mute button. They had to make a mute button, uh, and uh, <laughs> but it, it was it was what I, I wanted to see from both candidates was uh, what why should I listen to you? Why should I vote for you? And as staged as it was on Biden's part, you know, I was like, okay, you're, you're trying a little too hard here. You know, I didn't see that with the other candidate. Like, hey, are you? Because right now. The death of George Floyd, we can all admit that was crazy. Even Mitch, you know, you you took the time out to go march in the streets. Uh, and I, I know you said you didn't have to, but, I mean, you did that, you know. Uh, but, Mitch, when you were when you were protesting, like, what kind of people did you see? Uh, man, I saw I saw a pretty diverse group of, of people of mostly all ages um, coming together uh to to be united you know like you were saying the the u united states like uh, i saw i saw a lot of a lot of a lot of different types of people there that were and, all moved by by what happened and upset by what happened you know right and that's what uh and to me mitch and steven like get off script here uh until this day that's very admirable uh to see you voice out and uh, you know, and do that. You know, to me, that makes me, you know, definitely admire you a little bit more uh, that you did that and you spoke out because that's something that I have I haven't seen since I've been alive. You know, and to see that so many people during a during a pandemic uh, going out to go protest over the injustice going on, and you know, so with that being said, that's the kind of unity that I think America is. Right. Uh, and I think that's what we need now. And like I said, with each candidate, who can make us united? Uh, and why is this election so historic? So guess what? On today's show, we have a local politician who's going to talk to us about the importance of voting. And I have one of our good friends to the show. Uh, she is a medical health professional, and she's actually battling the, the COVID pandemic at work. And she's going to talk to us why this election is historic. It's an episode you don't want to miss. And if you're only going to get through the first 10 minutes of this episode, make sure you go out and vote. But if you do want to continue to listen, it's an episode you don't want to miss. And we hope you stay tuned on the other side of the break. Hey, everybody. Lee here. And guess what? The reviews are in, and the Straight Up Show podcast is a hit. Don't believe me? Well, listen to what one of our guest panelists, Dr. Monique Thompson, has to say. Listen, y'all listen in to Straight Up and support this podcast, because I listened in before I came on the show. I liked what I heard. They're really focusing on keeping things real and being real with you, and I like that approach. So you guys support this podcast. So if you want to listen, donate to the show, have a subject idea, or even want to be a guest, just contact us at straightupshow at gmail.com. That's straightupshow at gmail.com. All right, so like I said, it's voting time, election season is here, and I voted and so it, it felt great just going back home to get a chance to to vote. So, but I wanted to talk to an actual politician, especially somebody back in my hometown, about how a voter turnout, especially for early early voting, has been uh, it's been record breaking and it's been phenomenal. So coming to our show today, I have Cato Commissioner from District Three, Mr. Stephen Jackson. How you doing, today, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, yes, sir. So, hey, it's election season. I'm pretty sure you've been busy. Uh, it, it, it's been crazy. You, about, I hope everything's yeah. – and you're a Graham fam. So, I mean, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. I wanted to go to Graham. I want to play ball, but they didn't have my scholarship. But I still love oh, Graham. Yes. I still love Graham and love the Graham. My, my whole family is from Graham. So, 
got I love Grambling. So uh got some some GSU and some Tigers in the building. But uh thank you so much for being on the show. We didn't want to hold you up too too long. So uh we're gonna dig right into it. So uh, first things first, I just got back home uh from Dallas to mm-hmm. go vote in uh Shreveport. And one thing that I have not seen since I've been able to vote is to see these long lines of people re- going to go vote early. Like, can you explain like why we're having such a massive outturn right now? Well, I, I think uh, over the years, uh, early voting has become more popular uh, simply because it's convenient. A lot of people have started to realize that it's convenient to just go ahead and get it out of the way uh, because typically uh, you don't really know what the weather will be like on um, election day. Uh, you might have car issues, emergencies may come up that may take you away from uh, election day voting. So most people are, are starting, more and more people are starting to find the convenience of early voting, uh, something that they just prefer to do. And then there's a greater emphasis from candidates. Uh, I can tell you being a candidate a couple of times on the ballot, uh, there's a push toward uh, basically securing those votes, uh, basically securing the early voters uh because we, that's considered laney out. Uh, if you go ahead and lock in those voters and you go up by 300, 400 voters in the early vote, that's 300, 400 voters that you don't have to worry about trying to mobilize on election day. You can reach back and get some more, probably a little less active voters uh, to get engaged. So it's, it's, a, it's a two-pronged approach. I think one, uh, or, or, and then there's another one asset that I'll talk about as well, but one is that uh, it's becoming more popular and convenient among voters. And then there's a push from candidates. But two, uh, there's also this concern about uh, mail-in, ballot, mail-in ballots and people just not trusting uh, what uh, the Trump administration may try to pull on the election day as a last minute surprise. And that's just the reality. And so a lot of people are trying to go ahead and get their early vote out the way. And do you think, and you know, uh, we try to stay away from like just picking sides, but uh, there has been a lot of threats, especially with uh, voter suppression. Uh, I know that definitely has played a big factor uh, in this upcoming election. But, I mean, have you all have heard anything about voter suppression in uh, Caddo at all? No, I, I haven't heard about voter suppression. You know, I'm I definitely not going to say that it's not happening in other places. Um, we have a, a registrar voter who is working. Uh, he and his staff has worked tirelessly. Uh, to make uh, voting accommodations. Individuals with disabilities are able to go ahead and go in the front of the line so they don't have to stand out all day, uh, but they have to have a documented disability or senior citizens, uh, individuals of a certain age, they're able to go ahead and go in front of the line. Um, We tried to get an additional early voting location, but the state law uh, dictates how that is set up. And so basically, uh, we we still right now have that one uh, voting location, but we hope that in the future, and I know folks uh, here in Caddo Parish were a little bit upset about it, but what I would tell them is, you know, there's a process that we have to follow. And if we don't follow that process, then you run the risk of having uh, ballots invalidated. Why would we go and do something uh, that will cause individuals uh, ballots to be invalidated? We know that the Trump administration is looking for reasons to invalidate votes. Why would we do that? Uh, so we're having to follow the law and we're going to follow the law with regard to setting up our satellites. But I want to challenge those people when we do set those satellites up. Uh, if it's the December 5th, a lot of people don't realize that there's a December election in Louisiana. If the early voting location is there, we need you to show up. There's a municipal election in March 2021. We need you to show up then uh, to the early voting because it's not just a one time early voting location. It's going to be a consistent second early voting location. And the last thing I want to hear from my colleagues is, well, you know, we set the second early voting location up, but uh, we had real low turnout. <laughs> and I don't know if we need, really need to continue to do early vote. So we have to do more than just turn out when it's a presidential election. Right. And I kind of want to gear uh, switch to that, that, that subject at hand because uh, that has been an issue, especially me working for a news network, being the election coordinator. Uh, for the production of the election day coverage. I, I just want to know, because one thing that stood out to me was I had uh, Brother Charles Johnson uh, on the show, and he told me that, or actually had a, a, a police officer uh, for Cattle Parish on the uh, the show, and he said that, that that 
and there was an election where there was an issue with a, a local sheriff and that only 23,000 people voted uh, in that particular election, you know, and people don't understand that, hey, in Caddo, that, you know, you don't go to Shreveport City Jail, you go to Caddo Parish Jail, you don't go to Shreveport Court, you go to Caddo Court, and so many people don't know what it is, but 23,000 people voted uh, in that election, it's over, I think, 200, over 400,000 people in the parish alone. Why it's do you 200,000. 200,000, 200, okay. Uh, why do you think that, like you said, there's the election in December. Why do you think that these smaller elections get overturned? But the thing is, is that it really burns the city itself because. Well, yeah, and that's a problem. That, again, that's going to be just like the early voting question. That that really and truly is a two part approach. Uh, I can tell you that voter apathy is there. I can tell you, you go from when you go from having a mayor's election one year a governor's and a sheriff's election the next year, the presidential election the year after that. <laughs> and then you got, you know, this sort of off cycle or off election the fourth year. And then you're right back to the mayor's election, the governor and the sheriff's election, and then the president. So it's, it's in Louisiana basically every year, except that that off year uh, is not an election. So 2020, there won't be a statewide election in Louisiana, right? Right. But starting 2021, well, I'm sorry, not 2021, not 2020, 2020, 2021, let me, let me rephrase. 2021, there will not be a statewide election in the state of Louisiana, right? But 2022, you're right back at a mayor's election. Then 2023, you're right back at the governor's and the um, and the uh, sheriffs are running. Then 2024, you're right back at the presidential election. So mm -hmm. there is a sense of voter fatigue where voters are just basically saying, look, man, it, it's so much going on. Do I really uh, want to continue to engage and engage? And, and let's be honest, uh, as a candidate, what we typically focus on as candidates are the high volume turnout voters. Um, it's, it's scientifically proved, uh, political scientists will show you that uh, you get more bang for your buck in just turning out chronic voters. And so the strategy is target the chronic voters. And that's typically how most campaigns are targeted. If you look at how campaigns are run right now, uh, Joe Biden is not gonna spend a lot of money in the state of Louisiana because he realizes that he's not gonna win right. Louisiana. He's not gonna flip Louisiana. So he's gonna focus his money and his resources in areas and with people uh, that he knows he can convince, he knows he has to turn out. And so it's, uh, I can tell you, uh, somebody once told me, said uh, uh, campaigning and being elected is as much as a science as it is an art and is as much as art as it is a science. And so there's a science uh, to some of those things. Is it the best method? No. I'm not going to say it's best for our democracy because we have this very low uh, voter engagement. I mean, with all of the money that's being spent in this election, there's still going to be millions of people that are not going to cast a ballot. <laughs> with all that's going on around us, there are going to be millions of people that are going to go election day and not cast their ballot. And you would think like, well, how did you not? I mean, we've been talking about this race for three years now. How do you? How could you have not gone? We're in the middle of a pandemic where you've got a president that's done this and that and that. How can you not make your voice known? And so, but that's the reality. And so uh, I think that campaigns have to change their approach uh, with regard to voter engagement. Um, and then we also have to take personal responsibility as voters uh, to become more engaged. As I told people on Facebook the other day, you know, don't just complain to me about early voting locations for the presidential race. Make sure we're just as enthused and have that same energy about early voting locations for these off election races that we have to have. Right. And that's, that, that's just honestly, it's frightening to see that people just don't take it as serious. Uh, my grandma, like I said, until the day, the month that she died, she went to go vote in the 2016 election, and she died uh, a month later. And I'm like, but that's absolutely so sorry to hear that. 
Yeah, and that shows how critical it was because she lived right. in a time to where she couldn't vote not only as a woman, but as a black woman. As a black woman, right. So just imagine how serious she took voting and she was there every election. And I hate the fact that they closed that Moortown uh, school down to where they had to go to a different polling location for the neighborhood. But it 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 it, it, it makes me want to be a better voter because she the her more town is back open now. <laughs> oh, it's back open now. Okay, tell yeah, me something. Yeah, so. back open. Yeah, because yeah. I saw I saw my app and it said that uh, it was Morningstar now. So I was like, okay. Now they may have just oh okay they yeah. may have recently moved it, but last oh. election it was open. Okay, yeah, because I use the app, and if you're using that app, you can go to uh, Go Vote. Uh, there's an app you can actually go see where you're registered to go vote in on okay. election day. Uh, but okay. no, but no. The reason why I said is like you know there has okay, let's let's move back up. We went to 2008, Obama, the election turnout was phenomenal. Change was made, and then he did eight years, right? 2016, Obama's going away, so people were just like, well, we don't want to be as committed. And we have four years of Donald Trump to where people don't agree with his things. There has been a division amongst Americans, and now voter turnout has been you know, phenomenal now. Do you think that we can stop skipping these... The, see, do you think that this is a lesson learned about how important uh, it is to vote? Well, uh, I still we still have to get to November third. What I will say is, I'm I'm proud of the early vote turnout that we're seeing right now, but we still have to get to November third because what could be what could ultimately happen, and we haven't taken this into consideration is we're seeing high Democrat turnout for election day, but there could be an even greater turnout amongst Republicans on election day. Uh, and so is it going to offset, are we going to continue to see high turnouts on November 3rd? Uh, or are some of the lower, because what we're seeing right now are uh, chronic voters turn out to cap people who would have gone to vote on, number, on November 3rd are turning out to early vote and do mail-in ballots. The question is, is that momentum and saying uh, volume going to continue with lower those in, in voting and in, in, uh, campaigning, we categorize them as ones, twos, threes, and fours, okay? The fours, the fours are going to go vote come hell or high water, uh, regardless rain, sleet, snow, they're going to get to the poll. The threes, uh, they may miss a uh, municipal election. They may sit one out every blue moon. The twos are typically going to vote uh, in just the presidential election only. Um, the ones are, you know, they're issue based. If it, if it doesn't resonate with them, they're not going to go vote. And so right now, what we're seeing is the fours. The fours are going to go vote. The threes are going to go vote. The question is on election day, are those twos and ones going to turn out in record numbers to go vote? Because Republicans are going to turn out on election day to go vote. And so that's something that I think, you know, we as Democrats shouldn't start popping champagne bottles just yet. Um, and so uh, it, we, I'm proud to see these early vote numbers, but then I also want to make sure that I hope that there's a strategy to mobilize people as well on election day. Um, 2016, uh, we had two different candidates. There was a lot of animosity amongst the Hillary and the Bernie camp. A lot of people felt like Bernie Sanders got burned in the process, and it was just so much going on. And the Republican Party seized on that. They realized that there was uh, a rift within the Democratic Party. And to be honest, um, Trump made the campaign about the person Hillary Clinton. And there were people who just did not like Hillary Clinton. Uh, they haven't liked Hillary Clinton since she got to Washington, D.C. They thought that, you know, who was this lady coming up in here trying to be something? And I, I voted for Hillary. I supported Hillary. I campaigned for Hillary. But unfortunately, there were people out there who just felt that, you know, um, we'll just sit this one out. And I think it has caused us particularly when we look at the situation at the Supreme Court, uh, it's cost us quite a bit uh, in the aftermath. And I think people have really learned that lesson. Um, I think a lot of people realize that Trump is not 
who they represent in America, a lot of the more independent Republicans. Um, um, I think those people realize that this is just not the America that they believe in. This race ultimately is gonna be decided in my humble opinion by two groups. There are the Reagan Democrats and the Bush Republicans. And I don't know if people are deep wow. enough to understand that, but the Reagan, the Reagan Democrats, the people who are Reagan Democrats and Bush Republicans, uh, who the Bush Republicans who they believe in conservative values, they believe in uh, conservative principles, but they're not the Tea Party. They don't go so extreme as to say, you know, defund the Department of Education or <laughs> defund HUD or, you know, they're not, they're not using these racial epithets out there. That's the Bush Republican. The uh, Reagan Democrats are the Democrats who, you know, they may believe in uh, trickle down economics, but they may disagree on abortion or vice versa. They may agree that abortion is wrong, but they disagree on trickle down economics. And so they take up these philosophies um, um, that that basically, and those are the voters that Joe Biden is trying to court. In contrast, Donald Trump is trying to court the Bill Clinton Democrat or the Bill Clinton Republicans. Um, a lot of people said Bill Clinton was an afterthought, but the reality is Bill Clinton was the last president to win Southern states. And Joe Biden will not be able to win the White House without Florida. Yep. It's just not going to happen. That's true. Uh, and then you got Texas, Teeter Talk. They have Texas as a purple state right now. So they've got Texas as a purple state, but I never truly believe that. Uh, I believe it when I see it. It was per they, they alleged it was purple with Beto O'Rourke. Uh, I, I think that's just kind of what they do to sound the alarm for Texas to get up and go vote. That's all that is. But you've got <laughs> these, you've got these moderate Democrats out there who, like Governor John Bell Edwards, um, they are pro-life, they, they are Second Amendment, they believe in the Second Amendment, you know, but they're gonna attend the NAACP uh, Freedom Fund Banquet as well. So uh, Trump is trying to court those voters and Joe Biden is trying to hold on and let them know, look, you know, I'm safe. I'm not coming to take your guns. You know, I'm, I'm to be honest, you know, I'm a white male, uh, I'm one of you, I understand. I'm not coming to take your guns. I'm, I'm not coming to uh, kill off offshore drilling jobs and those kind of things. And so they're, they're, there's a small, finite group of people that are truly undecided and are truly trying to be courted at this point. Wow, I know you. that was a long answer. No, 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 no. That's perfect. I mean, you actually answered some questions I was going to ask you. Uh, we're going to have a little bit more here with Stephen Jackson, Cattle Commissioner District 3 on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. Hey, Calvin here, host of the Straight Up Show podcast. And guess what? We're back bigger and better than ever with new guests, new Straight Up topics, and a new way to support the Straight Up Show podcast. That's right. You can now support our podcast by becoming a Patreon patron. Straight Up has four different tiers that you can choose from, with each tier having their own perks. Your monthly donation helps us produce efficient Straight Up content that you love so much. For more details, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash straight up show podcast 318. That's patreon.com forward slash straight up show podcast 318. All right, so we're back with Stephen Jackson, Cattle Commissioner, uh, District 3 uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana. If you don't know, Shreveport doesn't have counties, we have parishes. Uh, and he's been in politics for a while now. And like I said, he is a, a grandmother. But before we even go any further, just tell us right quick, how did you get so involved in politics? Uh, I got involved in uh, public policy or, or, or politics. Uh, I came home thinking that I could, I could make an uh, impact in my community. I got involved in different elections, basically volunteering. Uh, volunteer on the mayor's campaign, uh, Mayor Glover at the time, Mayor Cedric Glover at the time. I got involved in, uh, in his campaign and uh, essentially worked 
you know, for free. Uh, I know they were trying to cut me a check and I was like, I'm good. You know, this is why this is, I'm here because I believe in a mission. I believe in a cause. Uh, and uh, I volunteered for our bond election and those kind of things. And then I, I went to work for uh, Mary Glover and just got involved with uh, planning and strategizing, uh, trying to plan, chart a different course for our city. Uh, and, and things were going well, and but we've obviously have kind of uh, went backwards since he's left office. And, uh, you know, hopefully at some point things will, will right the ship. And, you know, my mother, my mother's gone on to be with, be with the Lord now, but I understand uh, that she was, uh, I, I understand that she instilled in us a sense of service to others. Uh, she worked for 40 years um, in the Cattle Parish schools uh, system, uh, wasn't able to afford, <clears throat> wasn't able to afford her, uh, insurance until the Affordable Care Act came and my commitment was that uh, I would work every day to one be a voice for the people who uh, uh, whose plight was her was similar to her plight uh, but also to make sure that I was advocating for issues uh, and policies that help lift people up uh, similar to her situation nobody should wake up and go work 40 plus hours a week for 40 for 40 years of their life and not be able to retire. That's that's yeah. not an American dream. That's an American nightmare. Yeah, and a lot of people don't don't understand that. And I'm glad that there are people like you who came back home. Because I mean, trust me, man, going back home and just even just going to go vote just to see the city not the way that you know I left it, and it can be better. And you actually ran for mayor, uh, and you know there, there's a good chance that the seat might be open up here pretty soon. And uh, I know you ran before, didn't win, but if that opportunity comes again, will you take that platform and try to run for mayor again? You know, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's pretty early. Uh, what I'll say is I'm, I'm comfortable being a commissioner right now. Uh, I, what I will tell you is whomever is the next mayor, whether it's me or whether it's whomever, uh, ought to be ready to make some very adult decisions. Um, you know, we, we've got a budget situation here in Shreveport uh, that is very uh, dire. We've got to make some decisions where, you know, we've got to have an adult in the room to look people in the face and say, you know, you may not disagree with what I'm about to do, um, but this is the best decision for the future of this, for the future of this city. Unless you want police and fire picking up the trash and reading your water meter, uh, we're going to have to do these changes because uh, the reality is we can't keep going in the direction we're going. Um, we don't have much of a vision, uh, articulated vision, you know, all of this talk about um, international airports and all that stuff has obviously become an afterthought um, uh, when we should have been doing some other things. A lot of people were sold certain things in 2018. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we've hardly delivered on any of them. And so uh, I'm not ready to commit or decommit to, mm. to what I'm going to do. But what I will say is whomever that person is, is going to have to be able to step up and make some very adult decisions pretty soon. Yeah. And that's why I, I had to pick you, man, because like I said, I, I've worked with you before. And the fact that, you know, I think anybody who goes back home and tries to make a difference to their community, yeah. that's, that's admirable. And like, I, I this, this is my personal opinion. I think that politics should get even younger now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that, and nothing wrong with people who are of age, you know, still in politics, but you have to evolve with the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and this is my personal thing going outside the show. You know, I'm from Shreveport. And if you've ever been to Shreveport, it's the, big, it's the biggest city on I-20 coming from Dallas, I think going to Atlanta. So yeah. there has to be an attraction in, in between that. And I think that uh, we failed to deliver that. And this is me on my soapbox right now. No, you could. My biggest issue is, you know, going back home and there's a water tower that says Shreveport. And it looks like just brown stains all over it. It's not attractive. And right. even like, you know, when you go to Bozier City, there's a, you know, it says, hey, welcome to Bozier. Big right in your face. When you go to Shreveport, there is a welcome to Shreveport sign, but it's covered up by grass and you can't see it. Right. So, and it's just like that to me, that's like, hey, you know, that that bugs me because I love my hometown, but at the same uh, at the same time, it's like, hey, I got to put my faith in the, the politicians out there, and I think people like you who are young and you're hungry to see better for other people because, like, like I said, you grew up in Aladdell, I grew up in Moortown, City Grove, and we want to see our people who that we grew up with get better too. 
Right. We, we right. don't want to see our moms right. and our, our dad. Because I mean, I got cousins who are probably going through the same right. Your mom went through, got to work 40 years and just get a watch. Uh, right. You know, and that's exactly. like Dusty Rose, yeah. like, you know, I worked 30 years and they gave me a watch and said, your computer took your job. You know, you know, no, we have to say, hey, we got to put money back in our education and stuff like that. So that's right. why it is important to vote because, you know, the, the smaller votes, you know, can happen and make a difference. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to talk about policing, you don't want to necessarily, nobody wants to defund the police. But if you look at these amendments and stuff like that, you have the opportunity to make your voice heard in these elections, you know, so that's why it's important. But continue with Mr. Jackson. Uh, people keep saying that this, and both candidates for presidential said that this election is going to be historic. Do you think this election will be historic in your opinion? Uh, I believe it has the, 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 the potential uh, to, to be historic. Um, one, if Joe Biden is uh, elected, um, obviously, either whether Joe Biden is elected or Trump is reelected, we will have the oldest living uh, president. But I don't really worry about the age. Uh, Jimmy Carter is 90 plus building houses. Uh, uh, George H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush was 90 jumping out of airplanes for his birthday. So I'm not really that much worried about about um, about uh, age being a factor. Uh, they've got the best health care and the best doctors surrounding the president. So that's not age should be age should be the least of our concern. People are living older. Um, but of course, if uh, Joe Biden wins, Kamala Harris would be his vice president. Uh, I don't see him running for a second term. Um, so I think it is sort of a testing ground or an audition for uh, Kamala Harris to step into that role. Uh, and so it's going to be very pivotal. Uh, I think the next uh, president uh, may have, he may have one or two Supreme Court appointments because Stephen Breyer is getting up in age. Clarence Thomas is getting up in age. Uh, so they will have at least one or two uh, Supreme Court appointments. Uh, then you've got the whole situation with how we're going to deal and combat this virus and reopen our economy and get back to some type of normalcy uh, to, uh, with regard to this virus. So it's going to be a very consequential. I don't know if historic is the name to give it right now, but it's going to be very consequential. And uh, if we continue down the path of Trump, um, will we continue to put, you know, personal interests above public, public safety and public health? Um, and, and so there's just so many things that we have to do. Are we going to continue to have a president in the White House who refuses to condemn white supremacy, who tends to flame the racial fires, uh, throw flame, throw douse flames onto the racial fires? Uh, so uh, I just don't know uh, why we would continue to go down that path, but it's going to be very consequential. I can say that much. Okay. Let me, uh, as, as often as I do on this show, I play devil's advocate, you know what I mean? Sure. And, you know, me, like I guess I was the election coordinator at my, old, my previous job. So I'm around politics all the time. And like I said, I wouldn't say I fit the narrative of a, of a Democratic Reagan, <laughs> a Reagan Democrat. But I mean, I, I mean, just learning and being around different cultures, I've learned different, you know, policies and stuff like that. Okay. Playing devil's advocate. Do you think that Donald Trump is misunderstood? Uh, I think Donald Trump is mis. I think Donald Trump wants to be misunderstood. Let me let me put it that way. I think Donald Trump wants to be the underdog. I think Donald Trump, his personality is that he wants people to perceive him as a victim. Uh, I think he wants to be. Because the more you have to double back to him and say, well, Mr. President, if you didn't say, if, if, if that's not what you meant, then what did you mean? The point is, you still have to come back to him. The attention stays on him. Um, if I was a business person, this conversation was taking place in the barbershop. If I was a business person, um, the, if, the information about him paying $750 in personal federal income taxes, that probably wouldn't have bothered me if I was a business person. Because as a business person, most business people are looking for the loophole to pay to have their tax liability limited. And so as I posted on Facebook, 
most of his wealthy, well-to-do friends, business supporters, they're probably trying to figure out who his CPA is. <laughs> Like hook me yes. up. <laughs> you know, they're trying to figure out well who's who 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 did he write off? Who he got how did he get that right off? Who do who does who is he using? <laughs> and so if you're a business person, you can see it from a different perspective as an individual who, you know, if you are a like I am, if you are young, single, making decent money, and you get a tax liability of $1,000, $1,200, and your tax liability is that much, and you don't know that you really need to be putting more in your retirement, uh, and that's why you're being probably being uh, penal. That's probably why you're being uh, paying so much in federal income taxes is you're not putting enough up in retirement. Um, then you're probably looking at it and like, well, good grief. He's only paying seven hundred fifty dollars. He's found all these loopholes, and so it just depends on what lens you're looking at it from. Uh, I'm not going to say he's wholesale misunderstood, but I will say I think it's to his advantage that he likes to he likes to be misunderstood, and I, I don't think he sees the downside in that. Right, and should he? And I guess you're still playing devil's advocate. Sure. Should he? Should he win this election? Mm -hmm. Should we? Should we all as Americans give him the respect? Uh, as the president, he I, I think respect to uh, to whom much is given, uh, much is required, and I think respect is something that you earn. It's not a birthright. <laughs> it's not something that that you just get just because you inherit an office or you just assume an office. Uh, I think respect will be given to him for knowing how to win an election and knowing how to play to his base and how to get out the vote, that respect will be given. But he's gonna have to stand up and he is gonna have to be the leader of the country who's staked his values on all men uh, being created equal and all men, the justice system working for all men and women. Uh, and so, you know, the issue when uh, Vice President Pence uh, went out and said, well, you know, uh, I, while I empathize with Breonna Taylor's families, I trust the justice system work, and that's lacking empathy. Clearly, there's some hiccups, as we're seeing now, with some of the grand jurors starting to speak out about the Breonna Taylor. That was information that they weren't even presented uh, in the case to the grand jury. Um, and so, and then you have some grand jurors questioning what went public about the decision of the grand jury. So, did the system really work? And for him to go on national TV and say that, uh, and now you're seeing these reports about loop, about holes, even from the jurors themselves, uh, I think he's gonna have to earn the respect of the American people uh, and not just think, that's what dictators do. Uh, when uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea assumed power, they're automatically respected by the country or you can be thrown in jail. And that's just the reality. Yeah. Uh, we, we live in America that's based on the right to disagree. And part of that disagreement is, you know, I don't necessarily have to uh, agree with the national leader. And that's the American principles and foundations that we were built on. And so I do believe that we have to have a president that's willing to do the work because respect begets respect. And you have to be willing to do the work. Uh, to earn respect. If I walk out of here every day with my pants sagging, uh, if I walk out here every day not taking a bath, cussing, going up and down the street, uh, uh, stealing, just doing, and I turn around and tell people, well, you know, y'all don't respect me. Well, <laughs> what else do you expect to get? Right. Man, that's spot on. Uh, thank you for answering those questions. There's this big, uh, I guess I'm not how you even word this right. But people always say that the Democratic Party is that the, they're brainwashing the black community, black and brown community. Like, why is this stigma that the black or Hispanic or the, the people of color have to go to the Democratic Party or that's the big stigma? Um, you know, I think that uh, what we have to do uh, is, is, is act. Uh, why are why do African Americans feel more inclined to support the Democratic Party? But we all, I guess, the question also is why does the uh, LGBTQ 
uh, plus community feel more aligned to coalesce with the Democratic Party? Why do Hispanics feel more inclined to coalesce and support the Democratic Party? Um, there are groups of people beyond just African Americans that tend to uh, coalesce behind the Democratic Party. Uh, what I simply tell people is uh, when you look at uh, whose values are what and uh, who uh, your values most align with, that's where they coalesce against. I think we see more African Americans now more willing to coalesce with the Republican Party. If that's what their beliefs are, uh, they're willing to coalesce with them and they're willing to stand by that unashamed. And I think they have that right to do that. Um, so uh, I don't necessarily think that there's a stigma that pe that African Americans have to be uh, with the Democratic Party. I think what you find is um, you find individuals who just question that and they automatically assume that African Americans, I know a lot of black Republicans, but I know just as many white Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, or more white Democrats. So uh, I don't necessarily know that, th that there's a stigma associated with African Americans and the Democratic Party. What I will say is that uh, what I have seen is uh, most African Americans align with individuals who are looking like they're looking out for them. Who are you looking out for, whether it's in Washington, D.C., whether it's the state capitol, or whether it's in uh, local government. In Louisiana right now, we have Republicans that are fighting tooth and nail to strip the governor of his uh, ability to respond to the coronavirus. We know that black and brown, the African-American community has been hard, hit hardest by COVID-19. Uh, I see Pastor Blake uh, being celebrated on Facebook today who died, who, who died from COVID-19. Uh, so many of us have attended funerals of our aunts and uncles, mothers, sisters and brothers and dads due to, as a result of COVID-19, but you've got a Republican legislature, which is dominated by Caucasian males and a few Caucasian females down there trying to strip the governor of his ability to keep them safe. Just open the nursing homes up, <clears throat> open the nursing homes back up. You shouldn't, we shouldn't be limiting when, we have, when we're clearly seeing that there are outbreaks in the nursing homes and the nursing homes, the elderly, the elderly and more frail individuals don't respond too well, don't have the immune system to fight the virus off. But you got Republicans down there pushing tooth and nail, open, open these. <laughs> Uh, what the Texas the Lieutenant Governor to say, Granny will be willing to die. <laughs> wow. No, you know, that was yeah. the Lieutenant Governor of yeah. Texas saying, well, Granny ought to be willing to sacrifice her life for our economy to be reopened. And so who do you think <laughs> people will, will coalesce behind? Who's looking out for me and my interests? Who seems to be looking out best for me and my interests at the time? And like you said, uh, battleground state for uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump is Florida, and which is heavily populated with elderly people. And as of right now, which is polling can be misconstrued right now, especially with uh, the numbers right. and everything, but uh, has him losing uh, the elderly votes in Florida. Uh, right. So, but like I said, these are just numbers. And like I said, on when the day of the election happens, uh, the Republican Party and others. Uh, do come out in full front. So we got to make sure right. not to use that. But that is a good way to put it. Now, with this election, we're talking about uh, the election, which is days away, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure you go out there and vote. Uh, my next question to you is, um, Do are you fearful of what can happen uh, to this nation uh, the day after or should either candidate lose? No, uh, we live in America, and I think Americans will accept the decisions um, that will be made on, on election day. Now, if we've got some situation where they're trying to send it to court and, and a court, uh, the Supreme Court, then I think that's when you will see uh, 
some type of situations going on, but I'm, I'm not here to predict any kind of gloom and doom scenario. Um, um, it won't be the first time an election will, <laughs> will have been swept or grabbed from up under folks' feet the uh, first time. Uh, and, and so, I mean, when you think about Bush v. Gore and what happened there, you know, uh, but no, I'm not, I'm not fearful. I, I think we're Americans, we're a civilized country and we have uh, checks in place to be able to deal yeah. with that. And the reason why I asked commissioner is because um, it, it, it's, it's a, I, I've asked, I got into politics around Bush, uh, uh, Bush Jr. And so that's when I started to pick it. And me, I tried to say, what did each presidential candidate, presidential candidate what did I take away from them? Well, with Bush, you had no now child, no child left behind. Obama, you got a, uh, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, My brother's keeper. And so I try to try to be mutual. You know what I mean? But like this is a whole different ball game of presidency. Uh, mm -hmm. I've never I've never seen a a cult like behavior with Trump supporters, mm -hmm. and and you know just the uncertainty of Biden. So that's that's why I asked if you were fearful of some sort of civil unrest. Mm -hmm. Nah. Okay. I pray that nothing, you know, like I said, we can be civil and not hate. It happens. We have to right. accept the outcome of it and be civil about it. Not do nothing crazy. Uh, you know, if you didn't vote harder or encourage more people to vote four years later. Uh, but we have Commissioner Stephen Jackson with us today. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, to those right now, I'll leave you with this. For those right now who are listening to this and they have not decided to vote or they say, you know what, well, my vote doesn't count. What can you say to these people who should get off their butt and go vote? What, what do you say to them? Uh, I, I would say uh, that uh, we don't have the luxury of just sitting at home, uh, not uh, taking the opportunity, taking advantage of this opportunity to go vote. For those folks who are complaining about the long lines right now, uh, I can tell you my mother, she was a poll worker. Um, uh, she was a, a faithful poll worker, and she always loved to see how it turned out elections. Um, she, was a, she, she loved, she enjoyed going to the poll on election day uh, to go uh, work the polls uh, for election day. And so uh, I, I want to encourage us to get up and get out. We have uh, hashtag John Lewis's name uh, over his death. We have uh, hashtag uh, Representative Elijah Cummings' name when he died. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a fearless champion for voter rights. Um, uh, Harry Blake here in town fought uh, passionately for the right to vote uh, here. They beat him within the inch of his life uh, here. Uh, we've lost so many giants uh, over the last year or two, uh, particularly those this year seems to hit harder. But then when you think about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, the most, uh, the most uh, basic thing that we can do to guarantee them justice is to get out and change, um, make change happen. Uh, to, to quote a uh, phrase from Dr. King who said, my people, my people, the battle is in our hand. And truly you can utilize your hands to affect change with this battle that we are fighting here in America. Um, and the Senate is up for grabs. Uh, the House is at stake. The White House is at stake. So we have means, we have a tool to be able to get Breonna Taylor the justice that she wants. The Justice Department can come in and they can open up a case if they want to. They can go back and revisit the George Floyd case. The Justice Department has the ability to do that. They have the ability to go in and revisit Sandra Bland and Eric Garner. They have the ability to do that. They have the ability to go in and tell police that we're gonna put you under consent decrees for excessive force. One of the first things the Trump administration got rid of under uh, uh, Jeff Sessions was consent decrees. All of these police departments that were under consent decrees, they got rid of them in their first year. Nobody talks about that. They were all under federal mandate to do sensitivity training, to, to diversify their hiring. So that's what's at stake in this election. And we can't just afford uh, to sit back and not participate in it. The Supreme Court is at stake. 
the Affordable Care Act is on the line. And so, you know, a lot of people in Louisiana are able to get care as a result of COVID-19, a lot of poor people at that, because we, we got Medicaid expansion, but Medicaid expansion is a byproduct of the Affordable Care Act. And so if we don't, if we don't work to preserve these things that have been put in place, we're really going to be in a, in a tough situation here. So I, I just don't think that we have the luxury to sit back uh, and um, and just be pat, be uh, on watchers or on lookers. Uh, I think Dr. King said the best in his in his March on Washington speech. Uh, now is not the time to uh, drink from the fountain of luxury. We just don't have it right now. Wow. Man, I'm glad I got you as a guest, man, because you really, you really brought it, and I, I, I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was Mr. Cattle Commissioner Stephen Jackson, District Three. Uh, hey, man, I, I don't know how. I, I, I just know that if I was still in town, man, I would vote for you every election, man, because I appreciate you, brother. <laughs> because, it's because, all good. No, because like I said, man, you're young. Gifted, talented, you know, and like I said, you speak for the people, man. And, you know, I, I pray that you keep doing that, man. I pray that you have many more years uh, in uh, politics and look out for the, the person that can't speak for them. Uh, if people want to reach you, uh, how can they reach you or maybe follow your social media or, or your page, something like that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Facebook. And uh, you can follow me on my Facebook page, Stephen, uh, Stephen Jackson for Cattle Parish Commission. I also have my uh, website, uh, which is sjackson uh, for cattle.com. I'm on Instagram, um, uh, not that Stevie J. You can keep up, catch up, keep up with me there. And I also have a Instagram for my uh, commission stuff, uh, which is I think Stephen Jackson for cattle or Stephen Jackson for Streetport. Um, but I'm always available and accessible, man. I try to be as accessible as I can uh, to people. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward uh, to continue to serve the people of Cattle Parish the best that I can. Now, you know, you know, you can let it just slide by me and just say, not that Stevie J. <laughs> right, <laughs> just, right, right, right. <laughs> All right. Well, well hey, uh, thank you so much for coming on the Straight Up Show podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from the Cattle Commissioner himself. Go out and vote. There is no excuse. Your voice will be heard. Thank you once again, Commissioner. Have a good one. Thank you. Tired of the same old boring clothes? Want to support your favorite podcast but don't know how? Well, you're in luck. The Straight Up Show podcast store is finally here. In our Teespring shop, you can find all the merch that tells the world you're keeping it straight up. From t-shirts to masks to even leggings, our store has you covered. Just visit straightupshowpodcast.com and click that merchandise button. That's S-T-R, the number eight, upshowpodcast.com. What's up, everybody? Brandon here with Straight Up. We want you to be mindful of the importance of wearing a mask out in public. We know it's uncomfortable, but believe it or not, you are saving a life. This virus has hit our community hard, and scientists are still looking for a vaccine. So wash your hands, practice social distancing, and most importantly, Wear a damn mask. All right, so I'm joined today right now with Dr. Beck Strama. Uh, she has been a guest on our show before, but I want to bring, her, bring her, in, her in today just to ask her how important it is to see Kamala Harris, a woman of Jamaican and Indian descent, uh, become vice president. I mean, how do you feel about the Dr. Beck Strama? Oh, man. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me back. Um, I, I don't know how to put into words how I feel about Kamala Harris being the official nominee for the vice president of the United States on the Democratic Party ticket. When she officially accepted that nomination and I watched her speech at the DNC, um, you know, I was just crying, crying happy tears because they opened that montage of her introducing herself with her sister, uh, talking about her mother who is from South India. My mom's from North India. There's so many 
similarities in, in our background. And, and I love that she's proud. I love that she's proud of being half Indian because not every political candidate or um, person that we've had who is Indian or Indian American has embraced their heritage. I mean, Bobby Jindal comes to mind. He was never pictured on stage with a woman in a sari. And that was a very pointed decision by him and his policymakers to do, which, which made us feel like he's ashamed of us because you can't be Indian. What kind of that to send? So, you know, I could probably go on all day about this, but I'll just put it like this. I mean, when I was flipping through Instagram and, you know, I follow these makeup beauty influencers and I saw a company that had an Indian woman in a lipstick ad and I started crying, which sounds ridiculous, but it's because I had never seen myself or someone who looked like me represented in a beauty ad, something that's so important to me and such a part of popular culture. So if I cried over an Indian woman being in a lipstick ad, you can imagine how I feel over a half Indian woman being nominated for vice president of the United States. It's a message to little black and brown girls and boys everywhere that there's someone who looks like you. They are not ashamed of their heritage. And because of the Indian woman who raised her, she is going to be, hopefully, the next vice president of the United States of the world's most nefarious and famous democracy. Proud. Yeah, and, and you should be. And like with her, she is biracial. So I mean, that's a, the best, best of both worlds. Her dad uh, was from Jamaica. Her mom was from South India. And I, she represents the best of what America can be, which is you can be more than one thing. You know, it doesn't have to be that, oh, she's only black. Oh, she's only Indian. Oh, she's only a woman. Oh, she's only a DA. Like, no more pigeonholing people into boxes. All of us are a lot of things and we come from different backgrounds. So I love seeing a mixed race person nominated for vice president because my son is mixed race. And so I feel like America at its best is a melting pot of cultures. And why try to say we're one thing or the other? Why not embrace all the things that we are and use it to our advantage? And that's what she represents to me. Yep, and we're just days away until uh, hopefully she takes that, makes the historic moment. And Absolutely. I mean, when, you, when people think that what they do doesn't matter, you know, I want them to think about the fact that what John Lewis did ended up helping Barack Obama get elected president. I mean, Barack Obama even said that. He said, on the day that I was born, John Lewis was marching into a prison cell because he was protesting for civil rights. It's the same thing here. I mean, my dad was born the same year that India declared its independence from the British. So in his lifetime, he's gone from being born in a country that is brand new to living in a country where someone of Indian descent is going to hopefully be vice president. Everything that we do ricochets for generations. So I stress that enough that all the people who tell you that your vote doesn't count, it's because they don't want your voice, they don't want your voice to be represented. So when people talk about, I'm done with politics, I hate the two party system, I hate you know everything that's going on, so I'm just not going to vote, that's exactly what they want you to do. So just remember every decision that you make, every vote that you make in a couple of days from now will have consequences and reverberations for generations to come so now is more important than ever to make the right decision and participate in the world's most famous democracy thank you jaya for that and and just to follow up what she said you all uh, one thing that really bothers me and it's not a race thing it's not a you know a fight for it's not a, it's not a competition to me it's about representation because you can't speak for me if you don't know me and I, the one thing that bothers me the most is when I watch the State of the Union, uh, whether it's with, with whatever president, and they pan to the sea of people and delegates out in the crowd. And we make up a lot of America, but you don't see any of us, maybe a, a sprinkle of us in that crowd. And that is very disturbing to me. And that's why it's important to go out there and vote. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if all you want to do is spend 10 minutes you can go onto Google 
and just Google Republican Senate, Democratic Senate, Independent Senate, Republican House, Democrat House, Independent House. What does that group of people look like? Do they look like you? And what do you want your America to look like? Because that's what you're voting for. So if you're not being represented in the party that you're voting for, you need to closely examine why that is and do what you can to change it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're days away from election night. Dr. Mitch Sharma, thank you once again for coming on the show. Uh, for those who want to follow you, how can they follow you on social media and all your other content platforms? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to uh, keep up with everyone who's listening. If you just find me on Instagram and Facebook, just search at J.M. McSharma, J-A-Y-A-M-C-S-H-A-R-M-A. And you can like and follow. And I'd love to hear from you to see what you think about how you felt after you voted. All right. Well, I'm going to go vote. She's going to go vote. But the question is, are you? Dr. McSharma, thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on again, Calvin. Wow. I mean, I don't know about y'all. That really makes me more motivated. I've already voted already, by the way. I, I started the show asking y'all if y'all voted, but I did vote. Uh, currently, I had to go travel uh, almost 200 miles to go vote, and I stood in line 30 minutes. It was simple. They gave me like a finger condom to uh to vote <laughs> and, and I, uh, I voted and it was really simple. You know, I used to be an election coordinator at my previous uh, uh, place of employment and I worked on elections, you know, every local small town elections. And I think one thing that messes people up is the amendments. You don't really understand what that means and they should really simplify that for a lot of people. But uh, just hearing uh, Stephen Jackson and Jay and Trauma, thank y'all once again for being on the show. Uh, to hear them, you know, be so in depth about the importance of voting, you know, I think Jay had hit on the nails that, you know, that in this country to have representation in the political office is much needed, right, Lee? Definitely, man. Um, as a gay person myself, I'm legit worried about my the status of my marriage at this point, because that's that's been a talking point lately. Um, and that's why I vote, man. This year in particular, I've felt especially powerless. And I feel like voting, I mean, it's its just this one little thing, but that's that one little bit of power I can exert. And yeah, I mean, it's a hassle because like you said, you know, they make the uh, amendments and everything complicated on purpose. So you have to do your research to know what you're voting on. But that's something I'm determined to do. And I'm I'm looking forward to, to getting this done. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, so just to speak a little bit about what you were saying earlier, um, I think it's very important and a very important election uh, to choose the character of the president um, because I, 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 I look at things in the past and compare this presidency to other presidencies that I've lived through. And um, there's just a there's just a certain amount of of decency that I've seen other presidents display, especially during times of of trouble and like you mentioned um, the uh, the protests and things like that. Um, I think it's the responsibility of of a leader to try his best to make people come together and be united. And right now, I think that's needed more than ever. Um, so that's definitely the most important thing to me, uh, this election cycle. Yeah. And, and like I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm apolitical, you know, I try to be, and I think that I really, one of my favorite moments was, uh, and I was a kid at the time, but when nine 11 happened, um, you know, everybody don't agree with George Bush, but as a president and looking back at what, how he united America uh, during that during that time, now the after the stuff, you know, with the female and everything, uh, but with uh, Hurricane Katrina, that's a different story. But uh, during nine eleven, just to see him, like you know, because I mean, we were all in a bubble. We did, this is a shock to America right. that somebody just came on our soul. And but just to him, even though you don't agree with his policies and some of the way he handled things, like at that moment when I, we needed a leader, at that moment he was able to unite people. Uh, and you saw so many people coming together just to say, hey, you know, I love you, or more people going to church because of something happened. Like, you know, you can't fault 
you know, I mean, everything. Because, like, even Joe Biden said, hey, you know, I made a mistake. That was wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's admirable. I mean, you, you got to respect that. And I think that the, the Office of Presidency needs to have, one, unity, uh, two, reassuring that, you know, I will go to bat for you no matter what, not just for a specific party or a blue party, green party, whatever, you know, for everyone, every American. So that's the way I look at when I vote. Uh, right. Also, um, is that, you know, our Constitution is not perfect, you know, but we, we said uh, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are correctly equal. And that's how I look at it. Like, I, I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm a devout Christian, you know. Uh, I don't believe in gay marriage. I don't. But as an American, hey, you know, the rule says you can do whatever you want to. You know, I love Lee. Lee's my, my good friend. We talk about this stuff all the time. But, you know, as a Christian, I don't believe in it. But as an American, hey, do what you want. I can't judge you. This is your life. You live your life. I'm an overweight black guy. <laughs> You know, and some things I do may not be agreeable with other people, but it's my life, it's my rule, and that's what the American losses I can do. Uh, and so we just want everybody to be fair, have an equal playing field. And I think that some people uh, who are at the comfortability of uh, having things go their way, they're seeing that, hey, things are changing, that equality is trying to become the norm now in America. And I think that's what everybody is preaching about. Hey, we want equality and fairness. You know, if we both go to, to like, you know, uh, A-plus school, make sure that we all go to an A-plus college is equal to, you know. And uh, I end with this. Um, my grandma, uh, and she, one of my last memories of her in 2016, uh, she she had undiagnosed colon cancer. Um, and she didn't want to get treatment for it. But my grandma was elderly. She didn't have a car all the time. But... It, it just baffles me that she grew up in a time in America to where she had to uh, pick, not slave picking, but people still pick cotton uh, when they were free, but she had to work in a cotton field in Mansfield, Louisiana, or Keithville, Louisiana, and got a whooping by her dad because she didn't want to pick cotton because it made her hands bleed. And she saw snakes and everything in the, in the, in the field. Um, but for her to go through the stuff, the civil rights, and to live in America to where you couldn't vote as a as a black person, and you couldn't vote as a woman, and for her to just to, her name was Bertha, and for her to be going to, even if it was a small election with five candidates on it or five races on it, she was at that polling place every election. And I think one of the most things I forever remember my, my, my lifetime is my name is Calvin, her name is Bertha and we have the same last name but to be in the polling place and my name's uh, signature under her name and we got a chance to vote for the first black president of United States of America and just I just remember being in her kitchen when he got the uh, confirmation that he won uh, the election and just to see her the tears rolled down her eye like to me that made me realize how important voting uh was for her and how serious she took it i mean i think that we take it granted for a lot of things in america um and i think that even though some people say well bernie sanders didn't get it i don't want to vote anyway it's your right so many people have lost their lives too just so we can have the opportunity to even go early vote stand in line because there were some days that we could use the same bathroom because of the color of our skin. Uh, so we don't go back to those times in America. Uh, you have to do your duty as an American to go vote. I mean, the people are saying they're going to beat people up at the polling places. Imagine getting your head beat across it with a bat just for walking down the street just to go vote. We don't live in that kind of America anymore. You have the opportunity. You have the right to go vote. Don't waste it. And I'm going to end the show with a uh, quote from Sasha Baron Cohen from a famous Borat uh, uh, movies. And Mitch, thank you so much for uh, showing me this. But I'm going to end with this quote, uh, what he feels about America should be and democracy should be. Uh, but uh, before I go, I want to tell all my friends, uh, thank you for Cattle Commissioner Stephen Jackson, 
uh, JMA Sharma, Dr. JMA Sharma, Lee, uh, definitely Mitch uh, for filling in today. Thank y'all so much for coming on the show. Uh, we want to continue the conversation. Make sure you go to all of our social media platforms or go to our website at straightupshowpodcast.com. Uh, you can talk to us. But if you have any questions, concerns, make sure you give us a call back. But uh, we leave you with this, and we hope that you take this opportunity to listen to us, go out and vote, no matter if you're on from the far left, far right, apolitical, uh, political, it doesn't matter. Do not waste your vote. As a comedian, I've tried to use my characters to get people to let down their guard and reveal what they actually believe, including their own prejudice. Borat did reveal people's indifference to anti-Semitism. When, as Bruno, the gay fashion reporter from Austria, I started kissing a man in a cage fight in Arkansas, nearly starting a riot, it showed the violent potential of homophobia. And when disguised as an ultra-woke developer, I proposed building a mosque in one rural community, prompting a resident to proudly admit, I am racist against Muslims. It showed the growing acceptance of Islamophobia. Today, around the world, demagogues appeal to our worst instincts. Conspiracy theories once confined to the fringe are going mainstream. It's as if the age of reason, the era of evidential argument, is ending. And now knowledge is increasingly delegitimized and scientific consensus is dismissed. Democracy, which depends on shared truths, is in retreat, and autocracy, which depends on shared lies, is on the march. Hate crimes are surging, as are murderous attacks on religious and ethnic minorities. Fake news outperforms real news because studies show that lies spread faster than truth. On the internet, everything can appear equally legitimate. The rantings of a lunatic seem as credible as the findings of a Nobel Prize winner. Voltaire was right when he said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. In the end, it all comes down to what kind of world we want. If we prioritize truth over lies, tolerance over prejudice, empathy over indifference, and experts over ignoramuses, then maybe, just maybe, we can save democracy, we can still have a place for free speech and free expression, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today, these rights are threatened by hate, conspiracies, and lies. So allow me to leave you with a suggestion for a different aim for society. The ultimate aim of society should be to make sure that people are not targeted, not harassed, and not murdered because of who they are, where they come from, who they love, or how they pray. Mm -hmm.